what is God's promise to Abraham? Um, I think it's a, this is a fairly well-known topic, even for people who don't know much about the Bible. Um, it's a, Abraham's a fairly well-known character. And, you know, in your Sunday school lessons and stuff, right from when we're, we're young, we get taught um, about Abraham. And uh, maybe it's just me, but even, you know, every time you step outside and look up at the stars, um, you remember, as Shane read for us in, in the reading here today, about um, God telling Abraham to look at the stars and see how numerous his seed would be. And it just reminds you of, of the promises to Abraham. Um, so... I'm hoping tonight we can take a sort of a slightly different approach to maybe what the normal is. Um, and I'll start with giving a quick overview of, of the promises to Abraham. And then what I'd like to do is present um, two different interpretations of you know, how people believe the Bible um, talks about the promise to Abraham and what they mean. Um, and then we can determine as we go through the talk what one is really supported by scripture um, because there's a, um, the verse in Acts where Paul commends the Berean Jews um, because they received the word with eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so so they didn't just take Paul's words as they were they went to the Bible and they, you know, and they wanted to make sure that's really what the Bible taught so that's what I'd like to do tonight present these two different things and then we'll see in the Bible which one which interpretation is correct um, I don't want you to just take my word for it I want us all to be able to figure it out ourselves because uh, for me the best way to learn is to to talk to somebody who has a different point of view and either you know um, debate with them or um, just have a conversation with them about your difference in opinions and you can work it out together you know what points are right and which aren't. So trying to defend and prove what we believe the Bible says really helps us gain that understanding and remember it. Um, so hopefully tonight everyone can sort of get into this and keep an open mind, look at both sides, see like what points are good on each um, and what makes sense and what doesn't. Um, and then think about or say, we'll try and make this a little bit interactive, um, how you would prove the points that are presented from the Bible. So hopefully that will be able to keep it interesting. <clears throat> okay. So, um, quick overview then. Um, we had some of them read tonight in the reading that Shane read for us. Um, but the first couple ones here starts in Genesis 12, verse 2, um, about Abraham becoming a great nation. So God says to Abraham that he will make him a great nation, he will bless him, he will make his name great, and he will be a blessing. And then later in Genesis 15, verse 5, God tells Abraham, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. That's one we, we were talking about earlier. Then the, the sort of second basic promise to Abraham comes up in Genesis 13. Um, and it's that Abraham and his seed will inherit the land of Israel forever. So we read there in verse 14, After Lot had separated from him, the Lord said to Abram, Look from the place where you are, look north, south, east, and west, for I will give you and your offspring forever all the land that you see. So that's the second promise of land. And then the third basic group of promises um, is that through Abraham all the world will be blessed. So God says to Abraham, In you all the families of earth shall be blessed. Um, and then in your offspring, later in Genesis 22, verse 18, in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So that sort of sets the, the scene for you know, what God has promised Abraham. Um, and now we're going to look at, um, I'll start with a view um, that I managed to find that supposedly refutes premillennialism. Pre Millennialism. Sorry, that's a bit of a tongue gesture there. Um, so I'll start off with this view, and then after we go through that, then I'll then present what we as the Christadelphians believe and how we can maybe refute some of the things that this view um, puts forward. Um, so I, I thought I would look at this one because I managed to find it, and I hadn't really seen a lot of the arguments that this particular view presented, so I thought it would be nice to look at something 
That was a little less common and maybe, you know, it was a bit more interesting we hadn't seen before, make us kind of be on our toes and, and think a bit. So anyway, here we go. Um, I saw this little graphic and I thought it was pretty funny. It's sort of hard to see. But you can see down here um, is circled Christadelphians. And so they've obviously lumped us in with all these other ones that I thought was kind of interesting. That are, um, there's some evangelicals, Pentecostals, um, Tim LaHaye, I don't know if you guys read the Left Behind series, but that was a thing about Antichrist and the Rapture and stuff. So I thought that was kind of funny that they lumped us in. We don't usually think of ourselves as being in that group. Um, but anyway, that's sort of what caught my attention. Um, so they claim to be non-denominational, um, but some of the points that they had with thought were pretty strong. Uh, and so I'll present their opinion. Um, a quick summary. Uh, let's see here if I got it here. Um, basically, their point is, sorry, with the whole rapture thing, their point is that um, the whole idea that the saints will be taken away by Jesus when he returns um, and then judging the world with Jesus stems from this idea that God didn't fulfill the promises to Abraham um, when he was alive or whatever, so that he must do it in the future, which is what we believe. Um, so they say that um, all this false doctrine about the rapture and stuff comes from that, and they get pretty intense about it, um, some of their statements. So basically, yeah, they, they, they believe that um, the doctrine that, uh, that God, sorry, that God had, has not fulfilled the promises to Abraham, it's a bit confusing, um, is false. So they think that Israel got all the land promised to Abraham, Israel became a great nation, which, which are true in a sense, and through Jesus all the nations were blessed, which is, is also true, but they believe that all the things that God promised were fulfilled. And then they have statements saying like that this premillennialism is a doctrine of theology of infidelity because it refuses to accept the plain teaching of the Bible. So they're pretty serious about this, um, and that it's apostate theology to say that God didn't fulfill it already. So I was like, okay, well, this must be interesting. All right, so let's start into their, their ideas. So they think promises have been, been fulfilled. They use a passage in Deuteronomy 22 that says, Abraham's seed has become a great nation. Um, it says, Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons in all, and now the Lord has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. So they say, you know, these are, they're already a great nation. Um, Abraham and his seed would inherit the land. Joshua 21, verse 43 says, The Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. So that, that's fulfilled as well. The Lord gave all the land that he promised. Um, Abraham's seed would become a blessing. Acts 13, 32. We preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God hath fulfilled this promise to us, their children, and that he raised up Jesus, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Um, so Jesus is this blessing um, that Abraham was promised. So we might ask, what have, what have they left out here? Well, it seems like, you know, where was the promise that Abraham would personally inherit the land fulfilled? Because God said, to you I will give it. Well, their answer to that um, is, should Abraham have inherited the land personally? Well, they say that Abraham understood that he would not personally get the land. He, God had made him to understand that. They say, you can read that, it's very small. Um, if you want to, in the chapter we just had read, verse, Genesis 15, verse 8, um, Abraham says, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it, the land? And God gives him this parable um, in verse 11 with the birds and stuff. Uh, verse 11, when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abel, um, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a horror of great darkness fell upon him. So they say that just as Abraham vicariously suffered through his seed, but not actually, it's so like when they went to Egypt, so he would receive the land through his seed, but not actually himself. And they say that God never says something like, you know, afterwards you'll be raised from the dead and inherit the land. God doesn't say that to him, they, 
Um, and then they say, you know, compare this to Acts 7, verse 5 to 7, uh, where Peter talks to them. Um, and Peter says, He gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And then it says, And God spake on this wise, that his seed should, should, should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring him into bondage. And they say that that means this is what God really meant. Um, God really meant that his seed would get it and not Abraham himself. And then further on uh, at the bottom, sorry that red's kind of hard to see there, it says um, that Israel will serve me in this place. So the descendants, not Abraham, would receive the promise. Okay, so they say that Abraham has already received the promise. Um, and they use these passages as well. Genesis 28, verse 4. It says, um, That you may possess the land of your sojourning, which God gave to Abraham. So that word gave is in the past tense. So he's already got it. Uh, Genesis 35, verse 12. The land which I gave to Abraham. Past tense again. And then Deuteronomy 30, verse 5. God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. Possessed is in the past tense and you shall possess it. So Abraham already received it, they say. Then they, use, they compare this, um, this little thing with Saul. Um, Samuel says to Saul that God has torn the kingdom away from him today, but it really wasn't torn from Saul, it was taken from his descendants. So um, when it says to Abraham, he will give him the land this day, it's really to Abraham's descendants, not to him personally. So they compare those two. Uh... Okay, they also say that the promise of land is fulfilled um, because the, the cities of refuge um, are laid out in Deuteronomy 19. Um, God says to the people in Deuteronomy, set aside three cities for yourself. And go, if God enlarges your territory, just as he has sworn to your fathers, and gives you all the land which he promised to give to your fathers... If you carefully observe all his commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to walk in his ways always, then you shall add three more cities for yourself besides these three. So they're saying that if God gives them all the land that was promised, then they should have six cities of refuge. They should add three to the three that were given. And so what happened? Did they get six cities of refuge? Well, later in Joshua 20, verse 9 to 7, it says, So they set apart... Kadesh, Shechem, Kirjath Arba, and beyond the Jordan, east of Jericho, Bezer, Ramoth, Golan. So therefore they had six cities of refuge, so they must have got the land promised. Then in Joshua 21, verse 43 to 45, um, it says, The Lord God gave Israel all the land which he swore to give to their fathers, and they possessed it and lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and not one of their enemies stood before them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed, all came to pass. So they say, you know, it says here that all the promises that God made to their fathers had come to pass. Therefore, there's nothing to happen. We might ask, well, um, that's true, but God promised the land forever. To Abraham. So that obviously hasn't come to pass yet because Abraham's dead and, and his children um, don't have all the land currently. So forever, while well, they say that the continued inheritance of physical land is always conditional. So he did promise them forever, but it's conditional on them serving God. And they use this passage in Joshua 23, 14. Um, that basically God, uh, it says, God spoke concerning you has failed, all of them fulfilled, not one of them has failed. Um, and it shall come upon you just as all the good works, words that your Lord spoke to you, until he has destroyed you off from this good land which the Lord is God, your God has given you, if you disobey him. And then Jeremiah 18, verse 10, if it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I'll think better of the good which I had promised to bless it. So they say, well, it was only forever if Israel continued to obey God. 
All right. And their final point is that this promise to Abraham himself was fulfilled in heaven. And they use this passage in Hebrews 11. Um, you can turn there if you want, actually. That's probably going to turn up. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 19. It's actually a passage that we know well. We use quite often ourselves, just interpret it a bit differently. So it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going into a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, as lived as an alien in the land of promise. He was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Is God. And then later... Um, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So he says, there you go, a Abraham was looking forward to a heavenly possession of, the, of his inheritance. Okay, so that's their side. Now, let's see here. What's, what's wrong with this view? Um, well, we do agree with a few of their statements. Abraham's seed will become a great nation. Yes, Israel. Um, they inherited... Uh, under Solomon's stuff, they were very great. Um, they even came back from their land recently. They inherited the land of Israel. Abraham seemed to become a blessing. That's definitely true through Jesus. Um, that blessing that he has given you know, us help in salvation by coming and giving his life for us. Now, this is, I think, where um, we start to disagree. Abraham understood that he would not personally get the land. Well, I think their, um, their proofs are pretty cryptic, all this stuff about parables and stuff like that, and really don't hold up to some clear teaching in Scripture. For example, in, in Genesis 13, um, God says to Abraham, Lift up your eyes, look from this place, northward, southward, eastward, westward. All land that you see I will give to you and to your descendants. So God clearly says he will give it to Abraham and to his descendants. I mean, that's, I don't know how Abraham could understand it any other way. And it, there's quite a few of them. Genesis 17, the one we had read. Um, he says, I will give you this land to possess. And Abraham even says, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Speaking in, in the, um, personally there. And then Genesis 17, I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojourning. So I think we can see from these verses that clearly God promised it to Abraham personally and to his descendants. And Abraham would have understood that. Okay. Next one. <clears throat> they say that Abraham inherited through his seed and they talk about it um, verses like this that say God gave it to Abraham in the past tense so God has already given Abraham the promise. Well, I think their misunderstanding of this verse is because... Um, they don't understand some of God's language. God uses the past tense when, because once he's promised something, it's so sure that it's going to happen that it's like as if it already happened. Because God will always keep his word and always it's guaranteed that it will happen. Um, so he speaks about it in the past tense. For example, in 1 John 5, verse 11, it says, This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, gave in the past tense, um, and this life is in his Son. God hasn't already given us eternal life, obviously, but he's promised to if we're faithful to him. And that promise is so sure and steadfast that it can be speaking, spoken of in the past tense. And that's the same as how he speaks to Abraham about his promises. Then there's also the passages um, in Acts 7, verse 5, where um, it says that Abraham hasn't received his inheritance. Verse 5, he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And then if you're still in Hebrews 11, um, in verse 13, we read that as well, but we'll just quickly look at it again. 
these all died in faith not having received the promises. So clearly, um, the interpretation of God promising it and it will happen is correct because he hasn't actually given it to him, he's promised it to him. And that will be fulfilled. Um, okay, forever. That was one of the questions they brought up. Will, Ab- will God promise, sorry, will God give the land forever to Abraham and his descendants? And the simple answer is yes. If God promised it, then he will do it. He doesn't break his promises. Um, we see that all through the Bible. God's promises aren't conditional, as they suggest. Um, but he can choose when to fulfill them because there is no time frame given on, on, Abel, on Abraham's promises. And it's the same as um, when God promised to the children of Israel in the wilderness um, that he would bring them into that good land that flowed with milk and honey. He didn't say when. He said he would do it. Um, Leviticus 20, verse 24, it says, I have said to you, ye shall inherit this land, and I will give it to you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey, I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. So God promises it to him. He promises he'll bring it to him. But we all know that um, in the story of the children coming out of Egypt, children of Israel coming out of Egypt, they disobeyed God, they were judged unfaithful, and so they had to wander for 40 years until that whole generation had passed off the scene. Um, And so God didn't give it to that generation because they were unfaithful. He gave it to their children. And basically that's the same as these promises to Abraham. If Israel wasn't ready for them then, because they weren't faithful to God, they were mortal and all that, um, God will still keep the promise, but in the kingdom. Um, So yeah, same same with the promises to Abraham. Psalm 105, verse 8. If you want to turn that up, that's a pretty, that's a um, excellent psalm. Psalm 105 and verse 8. This shows you God's what some of God's character is like, um, and how He is definitely not conditional promises. Verse 8. He remembers His covenant forever, the word which He commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant. There's nothing like unsure or conditional about that. That's definite. God has promised it. He will keep it. And it will happen forever. Will it be fulfilled in heaven? No. Abraham was promised the land. He wasn't promised a cloud. Um, It clearly says, when Abraham was promised the land, God ended the promise. Um, if you want to turn to this one, it's kind of interesting actually. Genesis 13, verse 17. When, um, when God promises to him, it ends with the words in verse 17, Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So, so God tells Abraham to walk through it, and he will give him that land. He couldn't talk to me about heaven, because Abraham wouldn't have been able to walk through heaven and see it. He was obviously talking about the physical land. God was not promising a mortal life in heaven, but the land which Abraham saw and walked through, the land which we now call Israel. Another verse in Matthew 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, they are not, they're not promised heaven, they're promised to live forever on earth. Um, another, another passage, Revelation 5, verse 9 to 10. And they, the believers in the future state of immortality, sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So the saint's hope is to reign on the earth, just like Abraham's is. His promises aren't going to be fulfilled in heaven. Romans 4, verse 13. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So it says here, Paul, writing to the Romans, says that Abraham was promised to be heir of the world, physical earth. 
Hebrews 11, verse 8 and 9. Um, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. So he went out to the land that he was promised and he stayed in it. So it's obviously not talking about a heavenly place because Abraham lived there during his life. Okay, so, if that's true, and um, Abraham will be, has been promised something that will be fulfilled in the future, then this should be really exciting for us, because it means that Abraham has to be raised from the dead to have this promise fulfilled to him. So, we can be absolutely sure God will fulfill his promise, because he never breaks his promises, so we will resurrect Abraham from the dead, and as it says... Um, um, if God keeps his promise to him then he will keep his promises to us and raise and we have hope of everlasting life if we um, if we are faithful so Abraham will be raised Um, Luke 13 verse 28 says there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and ye yourselves thrust out so Abraham will be there we know that Mark 20, 12, verse 26, Jesus says, And as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So it's a pretty clear teaching here that God will raise Abraham up to fulfill his promise. Um, he will fulfill the promise. In Micah 7, verse 10, it says, Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. So that's pretty clear. He will perform that. Um, And the most exciting part is that we can be part of that promise. So God will keep his promise, and he allows us to be part of it. Let's turn to Galatians 3, because this is a pretty key part of the whole promise to Abraham. And I think this is why... um, We'll see in, in, the next, in the next verse um, why Paul gets so excited about these promises because they are so fundamental um, to our faith. Genesis, uh, sorry, Galatians 3, verse 26. <clears throat> Galatians 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to his promise. So this verse is saying that if we're baptized into Christ, and if we take on his saving name, then we become heirs according to the promise to Abraham. And so all this, this guarantee that God has put in the scriptures, that he will fulfill his promise, can apply to us and should excite us that we have that hope as well. And finally, the the promise that God says to Abraham that all people shall be blessed through Abraham. Um, I think this is how that will happen. The ultimate fulfillment of this promise of blessing is in Acts 3, verse 25. It's up on the screen or you can turn there. Um, Acts 3, verse 25, or, yeah, verse 25 and 26. It says, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, Jesus Christ, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So this, this here is, is Peter's speech to the people. Um, and he's going through the history. And he said, yeah, and like he says, that because God raised up his, his servant Jesus um, and sent him to us by turning us from our wickedness, turning us to God, being that mediator between us, then that allows us to be part of the promises to Abraham and in that sense, bless every one of us, so bless all the nations, um, just as God promised Abraham by doing that, by giving us this chance at immor- immortality and salvation. Um, and, and you can see here, this is where Paul says, 
um, how important this is. Um, in Acts 26, Paul's standing before um, he's being judged um, and he's making a uh, stand on his faith. And he says that, And now I stand here to be judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto Abraham. Unto which promise are twelve tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. And concerning this hope, I am accused by the Jews, O king. Why is it judged incredible with you if God doth raise the dead? So those two things there I think are pretty key. Paul says that this is why he's, he's being judged. This is what his life's about, is the promise to Abraham. And he also ties that into God raising the dead. So there's obviously that connection between the promises and God raising Abraham to fulfill his promise. And then in Ephesians, Paul makes it pretty clear. This is why it's so important um, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, the promise of Abraham, having no hope and without God in the world. So it wasn't for these promises, then we wouldn't have, Paul says there, we have, we'd have no hope if we're not part of the promises and part of Christ. So I think this is ultimately how the promises are fulfilled. All the nations are blessed through Abraham because they have the hope of eternal salvation. And I think that's the key lesson that we can learn from the promises and having a correct understanding of that can give us so much hope and excitement um, to be part of that and to be given eternal life. So we, I think that's our takeaway message and um, hopefully made sense and you can see the, the differences between the two interpretations of it. Um, and yeah, if there's any questions, then you can ask me after. Thanks.